Welcome to the very, very first live stream for the Jamstack San Francisco meetup. This is open for anyone to join, of course, not specifically uh, for the San Francisco uh, community, but for any anyone who cares about the Jamstack ecosystem and, and architecture, or, or just interested in learning it, you can join in and listen. Uh, of course, we are most likely going to have more live streams in the future uh, with different guest speakers. If you're interested in speaking at a future live stream, just let me know. Um, my name is Tessa Merrow. I will be the host of this Q&A. I'm, uh, for those who do not know me, I'm a developer advocate at Cloudinary. And of course I work remote. Remote life is, is the best life for me. If you're not familiar with how Q&As work, uh, you can post your question in the Twitch chat and I will do my best to be sure uh, your question is asked. Uh, if there's too many questions and we don't have time, I may skip it, but I want to be clear that I uh, have read your question. Uh, if you feel like I may have missed your message, just ask again or post it again. And yeah, Zemena VF says, Matt, your background. I miss Sarah's illustration on the website. Smiley face. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> also, uh, before we get started, I wanted to make it clear the raffle, you have to be on the Jamstack Slack, which is jamstack.org slash Slack. And also a viewer here, of course, um, if you can hear me talk, you're one of the viewers. So you have that down at least. Um, we are going to give away swag items, socks, gift cards, hoodies, uh, Jamstack workshop tickets, which is valued at $100, um, $25 gift cards. I didn't specify what kind because uh, based on what country you're from, um, it, I'll make it the easiest possible uh, gift card type like Amazon. Um, I was going to use a bot to randomly select a viewer, but since uh, that is not recognizing viewers for some reason, like night, night bot, uh, we may go a different route, like test questions about Jamstack. And I may like throw together some questions as he is answering questions or presenting. So definitely stay tuned to be eligible to win. So going to you, Matt, uh, what do you do? Who are you? <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> Big questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm Matt Billman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Netlify. He was the original architect of, of our whole platform. Of course, now we have a big team working on it and, and building it. Um, and uh, I work on putting together the the company that built Netlify. Nice. And, and how how big is the company now? We have a bit more than hundred people. Very nice. It's growing quite quickly. That's that's how you know it's that's a very successful technology product. <laughs> is there anything you want to share that that's interesting that no one knows about you? Or any, <laughs> anything embarrassing? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Like, or I don't hobbies. know what people don't know uh, my hobbies. So I used to, I, I used to study musicology, uh, comparative, comparative literature and cultural studies and worked as a musical journalist a long time ago back in Denmark. So here during the COVID lockdown, lockdown time my hobby has been picking up the piano again and and trying to learn jazz piano and jazz harmonics where i used to play classical piano so that that's been my 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 main covid hobby these days that's that's very nice i i love playing music i have a i spent uh, decades playing the clarinet i'm still not good but good enough the piano is very difficult. I try to pick that up and 
you have to have like a natural talent in your hands to like be able to do that or just practice a lot. I'm going to also kind of go back and forth looking at the, the Twitch chat. I don't want to miss anyone's message. Let's see. Yes, make sure you join the Jamstack Slack, jamstack.org slash Slack. I put an uh, outdated URL on, on the meetup. Setem Mojo, Miojo. Uh, I apologize is if I say anyone's username incorrectly. He says, or this person says, my favorite person in tech is Matt. Such a great, such a great work you all are doing. Is that you, Matt, on a secret Twitch account? <laughs> oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Phil Hawksworth says, spill all of your secrets, Netlify secrets, any secrets. <laughs> Yeah. If not, could you talk about why Netlify added build plugins and what they might be able to bring to developers? In general, what we did from the right from the beginning with with Netlify was just that we identified that that the way the web would be built in the future would be like a, this kind of Jamstack approach, right? Like that's why we had to sort of talk to other people in an industry and figure out a name for it and so on, right? But this idea of like decoupling front end and back end and um, pre build as much of the front end as you can, distribute it on a global network and so on, right? And 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 once we sort of saw that, okay, this is probably going to be the main architecture for the web in the future, we started seeing that every time you started like an, a new project in that space, there's just this set of, of tools and best practices you always needed, right? Like you always needed like your development environment, your CI CD platform tied into Git. You needed this concept of like atomic deploys, instant cache invalidation. You obviously needed hosting somewhere. We started seeing like serverless functions emerge as a really powerful paradigm for writing like the, the dynamic code you need. Often when you're working with the Jamstack, you might be working with it a lot of different APIs and services like Cloudinary and Contentful and Stripe and so on. And when you use them from the client side, you often need your own sort of dynamic server side code to connect between them and, and so on, right? And we saw serverless functions being a really powerful building block there. And then of course, once you pre-build everything and you have sort of a pre-built front end, you want it to be globally distributed on, on an edge network to really get the, the real performance and scalability benefits that this category can bring, right? So the early idea of Netlify was just saying, okay, if you always need to do that, we should just do that for you in the best possible way. So you don't have to set up all of those things every time you start a new project. And build plugins is, is just one more step in that direction where we say, okay, now we know you always have this build step. You always have like this, this CICD pipeline that like, picks up any change you do in Git or any change you do in your headless CMS, run a build and do an atomic deploy, right? So what are some things in that build step that that we see happening over and over again across different projects that are, that, that, that are not unique to like a specific, specific project and a specific developer? And is there a way that we can sort of provide horizontal solutions for them so developers don't have to build them over and over again, right? And, there's examples like accessibility testing, right? Like that's, they're, they're, they're great tools for, for running tests and so on, right? And, and um, there's standard ways of integrating those into your workflow and running a test every time you've done a new build and tell you like, is this version of your, your site accessible uh, to everybody? Um, and if people want to introduce that into, into their workflow, right? Like there's not really any reason that people should have to every time go figure out how to use the test suite how to run it during a build what step of the build to run it in and so on right like that because it's 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 not going to be different from project to project right like it's essentially the same right so, so I, the idea I have of a question i have a question with that yeah. Yeah. um if if someone's building um an app based on the jamstack architecture mm -hmm. and wants to add accessibility tools or performance tools where, yeah. you know, how, how would they f easily find this type of resources to, to help with their project? 
Yeah, so right now in Netlify, we've built plugins. We have like a public directory and you can simply like uh, from, from your site, go to the plugins tab, pick a uh, light speed, like uh, a speed testing plugin or an accessibility plugin and, and even just one click and install it. And then apart from that, underneath the hood of, of that, all the plugins are just public um, NPM modules, right? So we also just like, piggyback on the existing infrastructure around how do developers today find like their libraries that they're using when they're writing code, how do they verify them? How do they build trust in them and so on, right? Like, and, and, and the package registry is, is, is just like the obvious place where that happens, right? So we try not to, in general, we always try to, to look a lot at what are developers already doing and how can we, remove friction from that rather than sort of telling developers you should do something completely different. I love that. Um, what are best Jamstack, like, like which Jamstack best practices support the use of best of breed services, APIs, of course, in enterprise apps? And so for enterprise apps, um, like that, that's by now a really maturing ecosystem, right? Um, early on when we started Netlify, of course the ecosystem was much smaller, but now we, we have several funded like uh, frameworks in the space like uh, Gatsby or Next or Nuxt uh, or Scully. And there, there's, there's like real maturity there. And there's a very big and very mature API economy, right? Like companies like Cloudinary have like I absolutely, absolutely very enterprise ready and have been used in the enterprise for a long time. The same with Contentful or, um, or the like, right? We often, we often work since we're like in a quite central part of the, of the ecosystem. We also often help enterprises navigate that, right? Like, so of course we have like a sales and solutions engineering organization. Um, so it's common for, for, for large enterprise cus customers to also sort of come to us and, um, and, and have our team serve them also sort of as advisors. Uh, we partner pretty closely with, with a lot of different API companies in the, in the industry and with different um, agencies even. Um, so, so more than saying like, here's like, these are the ones we'll tend to look more on like, what are you trying to achieve? Um, what what are your developers currently familiar with and what are they working with? And how how can we best guide you to what's the most mature set of tools? Yeah, I love that. And, and you know, if, if they have a, a type of ob objective that kind of meets, you know, Netlify's goals, then, you know, why not work together? And it's, it's a win-win in both parties. And Netlify really is the best, any chance I can use their services, just getting into Netlify serverless functions. Um, if anyone has not heard that term, Netlify serverless functions, maybe a quick little summary of, of what they can do with that may be helpful to some developers. Yeah, for sure. And also planned in sh showing them a little bit in action, right? But the, the, the idea around Netlify functions is really just that, um, that of course there are, um, there are plenty of reasons why as a front end developer working at a, at a, at a web project, even if you mostly work on the front end UI layer, you need to write server side code as well, right? Um, ranging from really simple use cases where you need, for example, like you're integrating Stripe and you can do almost the whole thing client side, but as soon as you make a payment, you need some server side code with access to the Stripe secret API token um, to actually make the charge, right? Or to, to more complex scenarios where, where you're building like, um, where, where you're building uh, basically API endpoints, right? Um, or GraphQL resolvers and stuff like that, right? Like um, in all of those cases, we saw that this new paradigm of serverless functions that really emerged with AWS Lambda had, had, a, had an amazing potential for front end developers, right? Because like it changed it from, okay, now, just because I need this one API endpoint or this 
small handler code around Stripe or something, I, I need to suddenly manage a server somewhere, right? And run a traditional operations system, like with monitoring and everything, right? And Lambda sort of offered this ability of saying, well, I just need to write the code and then someone else will completely take care of like the operations, the scaling, the, where does that code run? And I just don't have to, to think about that. But at the same time, a lot time, of development time and, and money absolutely. and not worried about the security side of things and scaling. Precisely, right. But at the same time, we saw that with like the pure serverless offerings like, like AWS Lambda and so on, it was very hard to actually pull into the workflow, right? Because now, now maybe you just needed this little, this one API endpoint or a couple of API endpoints, but suddenly you had to like, set up a completely different deployment flow around that you have to figure out like how to think about staging and production environments of those functions you have to figure out like how do you synchronize the rollouts of your front end with the rollouts of those um, server-side components you have to think about api gateways and how to configure those and, and and all of those things right so the potential was there but it also presented a lot of challenges right so what we saw was that if we could like provide again, like not saying developers, like you shouldn't do that or you should do something different, but just saying like, how can we take all the friction away from, from using serverless functions? Then we could like make it much more accessible to, to a much wider audience, right? And Netlify functions is really just that. It's, it's a way of means like managing serverless um, server-side functionality together with your front-end code in the same repository and it takes part of the whole workflow we 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 build around git and deploy previews and all of that right so you simply just write functions and we make sure that they get deployed and uh, tied to like link to your to to your to your routing layer and so on and of course like i, I saw there was some some questions in 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 the chat around ssr and so on right of course, functions also make this as possible, right? Like you can, you can of course write a function that generates HTML on the fly. And we have, we have some demos uh, around that, right? So it can sometimes give an an, an escape hatch from like the more pure architecture. Um, of course, from sort of the architectural perspective, um, we we tend to advise that you try to just return data from functions uh, rather than returning HTML. Um, and 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 try to keep the architectural model fairly simple in that way, right? So you don't have to wonder does this HTML come on the fly for a server? What does that mean for runtime performance and everything? Or 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 is it pure data, right? But but they also opened up the the possibility. Great. So now people understand that you know Netlify, you can you can deploy uh, apps and. With, serverless functions and make it easy to have everything with the front end all combined in, in one area. So Netlify also has a CMS, um, but it's Git-based, a Git-based headless CMS. Um, why did they choose to be Git-based uh, and not API-based? I, I started that project a, a long time ago right and and it's 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 a pure open source project it's a community contribution it's not really a commercial part of of, of netlify but we saw early on just as this jamstack approach started started gaining ground we saw that there was a lot of cases where when you built like without a headless cms essentially right when you're just a developer you just work in git you just have like all, all of your data is either just like YAML or JSON files or Markdown files with front matter or the like. That, that's like a very powerful way to get started as a developer, right? Because you just have everything under version control and, and you have like a very pure process around it. And then we just uh, saw that there was often this need to, to give non-technical or even technical people that just want to sidestep the whole Git workflow, right? A, a path to contribute and edit the content without without having to, to open a local text editor and write Markdown or anything like that, right? Um, and we saw that there wasn't really any open source solutions in the space around that, right? So so we decided that that it could be an important community contribution to 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 build out sort of that open source open source layer. Um, 
we work at Netlify, we partner really closely with a lot of the API based headless CMSs and so on, right? And 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 see that as 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 a really strong solution for a lot of cases where you have more relational content and more complex content models and so on, right? But I still think like as part of just the pure ecosystem, it's it's such a powerful paradigm that you can just like put text documents in your Git workflow and then have have a UI that opens up that process to 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 external editors. That makes much more sense, and it's always more it's always important to be able to um, help non technical as well as technical people make it easier. Uh, it's a, a win for for all uh, all levels. Yeah, and, um, and still a really active part of the Jamstack ecosystem, right? Like there's lots of that there's even like quite a few companies just working on that side of the Jamstack now, like companies like Stackbit or Tina CMS or the like that, that are just really focusing on like, how can we take, like, how can we it's, keep it's, all the like, for I, developers? I, I, I'm assuming Stackbit is, is it Git based uh, since it's, you know, live and, editing? On the content. So Stackbit is is a is is a is an interesting one. Like they really just said, like if you work with this Jamstack ac architecture and you have like some sort of CMS, whether it's API based or Git based, and you have like a front end framework, whether it's like Gatsby or React or uh, Gatsby or, or or Next or Nox or WordPress, um, and you have this whole workflow set out around like builds and deploys and so on can they instrument it so they can like sort of know which part of the final generated part came from your CMS? Again, whether it's a Git-based CMS or, or headless CMS, which part came from templates in your repository and, and understand the whole flow through it. And then by, by knowing that, give you a UI on top of everything that gives like uh, marketeers and so on, real-time editing capabilities uh, on top of the site um, so so really interesting how how they are really looking into like okay all of these tool chains if we understand them well and have like a well-defined architecture can we then just layer on um all the all, all the things that that marketeers might have come to expect from like some of the traditional like site builders or things like that but while keeping all of the power for the developers to to work in Git, to work with like clean API based architectures and so on. Great. So we have a, a lot more conversations going. I'm getting a little behind on here. OK, let's see. What are your thoughts on the future of Jamstack in the coming year? What are your thoughts on the future of Jamstack in the coming years and Netlify's role in this way of building sites and community? Yeah, I mean, at Netlify, what, what we've always aimed to do has been to sort of, again, reduce the friction for developers in working with the Jamstack and make more and like larger and larger and more and more complex types of a uh, websites and applications like as as simple as possible to build and, and and operate on the Jamstack, right? So so we see ourselves as 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 wanting to keep pushing like the architecture forward um, and keep thinking through like what are the best practices when you're building like large complex real world applications. How can we make sure that there's a really strong, really viable ecosystem uh, around the Jamstack um with with solid solutions across content management uh, image uh, media management uh, e-commerce search uh, and how can we make it easier for both the individual developers the larger enterprises to to navigate that and 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 to build across this whole whole ecosystem so as part of what we're doing of course like of course, we have like larger architectural pieces that we are looking at. Like on the one hand, like what can what more can we do at the build layer? And their their build plugins is a start, but there are more things that 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 we are thinking through at that layer. Uh, what can we do at the edge layer? Like at the recent Jamstack conference, we showed a preview of of what we call edge handlers that 
it, that allow developers to to completely program the, the the routing layer at the at at the edge and have like essentially code running directly on our edge nodes uh, as part of the request cycle, right? How how can we how can we both uh, empower developers to use those capabilities while while keeping their architecture simple, right? And I think one of the things I always spend a lot of time thinking about as as the whole ecosystem matures and as this Jamstack architecture like evolves is how how can we keep how can we be really focused on keeping the underlying simplicity um, there's like this really um this really amazing presentation by rich hickey uh, the the inventor of the closure programming language um, called something like simple made easy where he talks a lot about like the the difference he sets up a difference between the idea of simple and the idea of easy right where you can have like very complex tools that makes something really complex seem easy right so so um and and that might be really appealing but it won't make the the underlying solution like if you have a tool that scaffolds a ton of code for you right like a, a very advanced code generation right like that might it make make it extremely easy to to start like a very complex project, right? But the project will still be very complex, and that complexity will leak out eventually, right? So as you dive in, you'll run into all of this complexity. Whereas there are other tools that might be a little harder to to learn, right? Like things like Haskell, right? That 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 no one would probably immediately think of as easy, right? Like it takes a lot of thought to figure out, like how do you work with like pure functional programming and so on. But it has like a very high level of simplicity in, in the underlying model, right? So once you understand it, you will have like a very strong understanding of what you're doing, right? And I think what's really interesting, like one of the drivers for, for the initial Jamstack model was that it was fundamentally simple, right? You have a build step, it gets deployed, and what's deployed is what you build. And every, every deploy is immutable, it's very clear, right? And we could make like we we could build the tooling to make it really easy to work with that kind of uh, architecture that has a very simple mental model, right? Okay. But at the same time, as the as the architecture evolves, we're seeing things like on the fly, like mixtures of of of, of static and and server side rendered, like uh, using stale while we validate paradigms and so on. That and 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 patterns like rehydration where you both built at, at server time but also rehydrates in the client and so on right and there are frameworks that makes those techniques really easy to work with but the risk is that you that that even if they get easy to work with they are not really simple right so as a developer you start running into weird edge cases that are hard to reason about right that's one of the things sort of architecturally that 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 I spend time thinking about is like how can we how can we try to make sure that as the ecosystem grows and more mature tools emerges, those tools don't just go in a direction where it becomes easy to to get yourself into very complex things. So, so as, we, as you as you're bringing in more and more and more tools that you're using, what is a healthy mix of technologies to power Jamstack apps between open source and proprietary tools, services, frameworks? I think in general, what what we've seen as part of the Jamstack again, and just software development in general, is that that every project now tends to like tends to organically have. A, a lot of different tools and dependencies, right? Like every time you you install a new, start a new front end project and and run npm install, you probably pull in thousands of different libraries from <laughs> from different people and so on, right? And as you start working with um, with different APIs and services, you start also interacting with with lots of different vendors and so on. And I think that that's something that that we shouldn't fight too much it's like it has challenges right but it's happening for a reason because it's fundamentally like um, a good thing that that all of these reusable pieces are getting built and that you can stitch them together rather than building over and over again right so so i don't think there's like a you should keep it to like free services or something like that as as a best practice i think 
the the challenges becomes more around like how how can we build platforms tool chains systems that makes it simpler to reason about how how your app is behaving when when you're using a lot of different dependencies and vendors thank you so we're about 33 minutes into this uh, i'm not sure if we plan on going a little over an hour to do some final q a so i am thinking how about uh we do your uh demo on the build plugins and then while you're doing that i can um curate the question the remaining questions so i can read and go through it and and then we can yeah. finish the q a uh, at the end of the demo yeah i might just start by doing something fairly quick um just just since i i just went to the um to one of the 11t startup projects uh, and i'm gonna quickly go through the deploy to netlify flow to um set up a new 11t startup blog um, just to get started um, let's call it something like this so what netlify is doing now is just like taking that starter template cloning the repository into my github account um, and then setting up like the full ci cd workflow with deploy previews and everything um, and uh, and starting a new build and we can see like the dependencies are getting installed uh, the repository has been cloned and everything um, and of course the first build will always take a little longer as we install all the right uh, npm modules and so on uh, running an 11 is just a, a, a very approachable uh, static site generator um, good for content based sites we we use it for for netlify.com ourselves um, so we run this build run on, on netlify servers uh, we'll do some do a deploy uh, and and um, probably a lot of you are very familiar with this process um, i now have a new a new website up on Netlify on a, a, a random domain. Um, and now, um, just what I wanted to show was that idea uh, of, of build plugins, right? Like, we now have this step. We have, like, a, a, a GitHub repository with um, with all the source code. And, and anytime I make changes in Git, Netlify will pick it up. It'll run a build. It'll, it'll publish the, the changes. Um, and of course, there'll be a bunch of things I do that specific to building this 11 c side if I keep evolving it and, and turn it into a real project and so on. But there'll also be a bunch of things that I can do in that build step that's that's not at all specific to to, to this side, right? So um, if I go here to the plugins tab, um, you can you can go into Netlify's plugin directory. As I said, the underlying part of this is just that every build plugin is is an NPM package, and every everybody can make them. You can also just refer to them in your Netlify TOML. They don't need to be part of the directory. But we have a plugin directory where we, where, where we curate well-maintained plugins. Um, and let's let's have a look. Um, there's, for example. Um, the the lighthouse plugin that's a that's one of the really popular plugins right so lighthouse is is a performance testing tool that'll that'll that that you can run against any any website to to see how um how well it's architected for performance and if i just click install here um and pick the site i just created i can now install this plugin into the build step and the plugin knows when it should when it should run and uh, and and how it should interact with the build. So if I just go in here and I trigger a, a new build, we'll see the 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 build starts kicking off. Um, and we'll see a faster dependency install and so on. Since uh, those will be, oops, those will be part of the of the cache. We'll see Netlify build running. It'll run the normal um, 
normal build, but it'll also say that loading plugins, there's a, a plugin lighthouse. So first we run the normal 11 build, we get all the output here. And then down at the end, um, we see run the, the, the Netlify plugin, like the light, lighthouse plugin, and it'll give some output here. But apart from just giving it there, you'll also see that each deploy has this little deploy summary. And we can see for this deploy, one plugin ran successfully, the Netlify Lighthouse plugin. And you can see directly here in the output of the deploy that uh, that um, whoever made the, the, the startup log for 11T did a pretty good job, right? Like 100% uh, in performance, 100% accessibility score, 100% best practices, uh, good scores for SEO. Um, not a not so much as a, of a progressive web app, right? And all it took me to get this this flow running was really just to 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 click the plugin and and, and install it, right? So there's a whole bunch of, of of opportunities for plugin that 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 help with testing, with verification, with compliance to accessibility standards, and so on. There's also our framework specific plugins like uh, the Gatsby specific plugin that will like once installed optimize like how we how we manage the build cache for for Gatsby projects uh, we have a similar plugin coming for for next that will a uh, out of the box let you take advantage of 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 a lot of capabilities that uh, that that next has around like dynamic routes and so on um and um and that's sort of the the the, the core the core plugin idea right like we have these horizontal concerns across different builds. Developers shouldn't have to manually set up uh, all the steps needed for those each time they they, they want to solve them. Uh, we should just have like uh, a, a, a way to, to install a solution. So that's a quick demo. I can always go in and show a bit more like how, how they work under the hood and so on, but, uh, but let's, uh, let's pause here. That's great. Thank you for doing that. Uh, in the meantime, I have a few more questions. First off, uh, one person mentioned that I just used Netlify CMS for the first time in a client project with a big smiley face, so that's good. Netlify CMS is so easy to integrate too. They always think about developers first. Uh, here's a, a question. Within mm -hmm. Jamstack, what are some ways to optimize reduce build times for much larger sites that change frequently. I've seen Gatsby yeah. iterative building, but do yeah. either of you have opinions on this? Um, I mean, of course, support for incremental builds in, in site generators uh, can can help a lot, right? Like we have a build cache and, and um, uh, through the plugin architecture, you can, you can um, orchestrate more deeply how you use that build cache, right? So you can absolutely for, for site generators that take advantage of it, um, make sure that that incremental builds cut down on the on on the time it takes to publish changes quite a bit. Another pattern that 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 we've seen commonly with with people with really big projects is this idea of of, of sharding the build into different pieces, right? So um, so one one example would be Citrix, where all of docs.citrix.com is like um, it's, it's a very large site, right? Like with hundreds and thousands of, of documentation pages across many different languages and I think 200 different products or something like that, right? And, and they've shattered their build per product, right? Like, so so if you make a change, it's only that specific product that, that rebuilds. And then they use, they use the pattern of having like a master site on Netlify that's essentially empty, that just contains a set of routing rules saying like, when you go to this part of the site, show this subsite. When you go to this part of the site, show this subsite, right? And then Netlify man manages the whole the whole process around that 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 sharding and those individual builds, right? So so that's that's a pretty common pattern when we see really uh, uh, really large sites. And then there then there are also people that build part of the sites as as single page applications, right? Um, if if they have like an API with a lot of content, um, and then use our our pre-rendering feature to make sure that that crawlers and things like uh, 
Facebook bot that fetches social media images and so on all gets like a, a, a server side pre rendered version where where normal users will just experience it as a as a single page application. And then, of course, there's a bunch of experimentation going on in the ecosystem around things like uh, on on the on the fly rendering and caching at the CDN. But I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit more skeptical around that simply because it 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 breaks the the sort of core simplicity of of um, consistent atomic deploys. And now you no longer know for sure what's live or not live. But does but does Netlify still... have any kind of statistics and and or stats and data on like what frameworks are used the most, what tools are used the most? We we have some and we like uh, at the at the Jamstack um, conference we also. Um, shared a, a survey we did of the of the whole ecosystem with where, where, where people gave feedback both on the both, both on the tool they used and the experiences with with using it and so on and of course internally we have some 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 data on like what what tools are people using across our build system um, but so i was, recommend was there like a 2020 like jamstack report or something that was released yeah, it, it was like the 2020 jamstack survey that uh, that that laurie uh, uh, Laurie did um, let's see. State of the Jamstack Survey 2020. Yes. Where can uh, these viewers or, or the community find this information? If they want to go, they can just um, Google that information. Google uh, that, these I've keywords. Just, I've just shared like a link to our. Uh, okay, let's see if I can post a link in the chat. Yep, I'm able to. Cool. Okay, so here's a really important question that someone asks. This person says, I'm in the process of introducing, aka convincing my agency to look into and use the Jamstack architecture. How should I go about that? What are the best tips you can offer on what to, sh to say or show? Where's the convince your boss um, letter? <laughs> if you if you go to our website uh, and look for the the part around customers and case, case studies those those are typically like really aimed around like the, the 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 business aspects of like why why would you adopt this stack right so um and and i'm sure like other other companies in the space will 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 have some similar list to share right but that, this is this is one of the things that that I think is really hel helpful about like the the ones of our larger customers that have agreed to do like public case studies that 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 you as a developer can 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 use those and see what they actually like what was their experience what did they get out for it and and a lot of these case studies have very real like uh, business impacts right like um, huge like many of them show like very big cost savings from a traditional infrastructure to to a Jamstack based infrastructure. Um, one thing that keeps going again and again is like speeding up the process to take a, a project live, uh, often by by something like an order of magnitude, right? Um, other things that 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 you will see is just the ability to to have confidence in in scaling when when you're expecting big traffic spikes um, like we have cases like the like the recent case from from Jamsec conference on covidtracking.com right like which which obviously is a project that suddenly got a lot of interest right like and and just the confidence that you can put it out there and not have to worry about scaling or uptime or anything like that right but yeah again i would i would um, if if you're looking to um, to convince your boss, then those kind of case studies are, are, are going to be really useful. And and to summarize that, to to convince someone, you really have to like list out like what are issues you're running into with your your company or service or product or, or whatever it is that you're working with, and and finding ways you can improve it uh, based on using Jamstack. Like, see, this is what this company did to solve this, and this is how using Jamstack helped. Um, you know, we're having performance issues with, with a page load. Um, here's how much faster we can do, uh, run our app if we, if we use Jamstack. So it's, it's and ideally, really, like really ideally, demo that. Yeah. And ideally you can really tie it, 
tie it back to to real bis- business objectives, right? Like if you look at at um, at case studies from, for example, uh, Loblaw or Digital, right? Like um, there there are huge performance benefits, but they also really talk about like what that means for actual conversion rates of their clients, right? Like um, because in the end, that that's the real business metric you're driving, right? Like is this is this going to help sell more for agencies? Like often, often the the speed of execution, the ability to take projects to production fast, are really core selling point, right? Like one another case study is like the the Nike Colin Kaepernick campaign that uh, that there was one of these where 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 suddenly all of these things were happening at the same time right and nike needed an agency to to build them like a highly interactive really impressive experience website in a very very short time right um, and just having the confidence that you can actually deliver that as an agency is is um, is is one of the really big business values of adopting this stack Oh, you, you, you mentioned Nike. Since my company, Cloudinary, is a, a headless media platform, uh, I think all of their images, are, are, all their media runs on our, our API. So it's just super fast media um, load and, and yeah. performance. So Wouldn't it's surprise me at all. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Yes, uh, this is being recorded right now as we speak. And I will most likely share this video on the Jamstack Slack. I think that's the easiest way. I'll provide a link to download the video or, or I may have um, have it upload to, uploaded to YouTube. So let's see if we have any questions. I thought I saw more. Uh, the chat is a lot more active than I thought. So this is really, really great. I'm happy for that. I'm just skipping some questions related to um, less on Jamstack and more on the product. So I skipped those. Here's a, a question. Are there Jamstack patterns that you see people fight against in making an app that you see and consider design smells? I wonder if there's a, a better way to phrase that. We yeah. phrase that. Well, it's an interesting question. Um, um, yeah, the the yeah, for sure. Um, I think it it depends a lot on the project, right? Like, one is just to try to use one tool for every every single single job, right? Like, I think we some sometimes see this and sometimes see like people taking a. a Maybe maybe picking a framework that does a lot of work f- for them, um, but ending up with like an end result that will be called out for having like a megabyte of JavaScript on the front end when when it's essentially a, a really simple like content driven site, for example, right? Like that's that 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 sometimes um, an effect we've seen from from picking a, a frameworks like oriented on solving pretty advanced problem or oriented around like maximizing maximizing the speed of subsequent um, visits, right? Like, so you load the first page, you get a lot of JavaScript, and then you na- navigate from page to page and it's instant, right? But if you're actually building a project where the really important part is like the initial load and the speed of getting that in, in front of the user, right? Then then you should optimize for 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 a tool that that's like purely HTML CSS based that just gets that content in front of the user. So that's one that's one thing we we've, we've seen sometimes happen, right? Like where where the end goal should be better user experiences and uh, and and where we should be mindful of like what are what what's the experience where we're actually looking for. Um, what else? Um, yeah, user experience, developer experience is always like top priority for for everything, and especially yeah. when yeah. when I went through Netlify and and learned it for the first time and and I launched an app, I'm like, wow, this took me less than a few minutes to figure out how to do all this. Like, why can't every tool and company like have documentation that easy and have a tool that's like this easy to use? 
So it's something I, I care about a lot, especially being in developer advocacy. Uh, yeah, I think it can, like, I think at core of it goes back to that, like, that thought I was maybe rambling a little about, but around simple and easy, right? Like, even if a tool makes something easy, if the output is really complex and hard to understand, that will probably end, end up like coming back to, to, to bite you in some form at some point, right? So, so don't just evaluate the upfront ease of use, but also evaluate like the simplicity of the full model. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon says, thanks for the thoughtful answer. That makes sense. Applying too much when it is not needed, optimize for the real need. We are uh, coming on almost an hour here. Does anyone have any final questions that's related to Jamstack? Or anyone new to Jamstack that have any questions? And and there's no such thing as a, a, a bad question, even if it's super beginner. It's still acceptable. There might be other people that have the same question. And I will give that um, a few seconds. Uh, in the meantime, did you have any uh, final thoughts or things you want to bring up? Uh, do you remember that the that the build plugins I, I showed it's all community driven. It, everyone can build one. You can even you can even make a, a project specific one just by adding like a, a, a plugins folder to to your project and 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 you can run it locally with Netlify build and test it and so on. And so I would love to see like what what people can come up with, what what kind of ideas that that can improve life, not just for 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 their own projects, but for but for um, potentially like the 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 million of of developers that are that are already on our platform. Very nice, and they can just go to netlify.com and 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 find the plugin page from there. Uh, someone asked if you can demo Netlify functions, but uh, is there a, a link that I can send them to? Since we probably don't have time for that. Yeah, it might be. I mean, I, I, I can always demo them, but it might be hard to squeeze into three minutes. <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, I guess I should... Uh, if, if you want to do any more questions or follow-ups, join the Jamstack Slack and just post and, and tag Matt from there. Uh, thank you, Design by Brittany, for posting that for them. And I think I should end it here unless anyone has some final words to say. Design by Brittany says, sounds awesome. Uh, people said, thank you. Thank you for being here. Phil Hawksworth says, thanks a lot, Tessa and Matt. Thank you so much. Lots of thank yous. It, this live stream would not be possible without you all being here, the community. There would be no such thing as Jamstack without a strong community of people who care and, and strongly believe that this is the future of making web apps much faster and perform better. Uh, yes, you're very welcome. A million thank yous, especially to Matt for taking his time from, from work. I can't imagine the kind of schedule and, and task list that you have. Like I feel overwhelmed to even like want to know. So thank you for your, your um, time being on a live stream. And you're welcome and... anytime, of course. And I will go ahead and end it here. So thank you, everyone. Be sure to check out Netlify. Go to jamstack.org, jamstack.wtf, and explore and learn. That's all we want you to do. And yes, thank you very much. And I will end the stream here. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you.